Praise the Lord, church. I'm going to be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 3 verses in Ecclesiastes. Hold on just a second, Brother David. I forgot to take the offering up, so hold on to it till after church. I won't forget when he gets done. <laughs> Brother Jill pointed me to a website that he uh, has taught us a series of lessons off of by Brother Raymond Woodward. He preached a message that Brother Jill had uh, played at prayer meeting one night. And I began to look through some of his lessons and began to, com- begin to read some of them. One of them just kind of stood out to me. And uh, I've kind of condensed it with a, another lesson that I had taught. So uh, I want to talk about broken down to be built up. Broken down to be built up. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. And I I really want to focus on the the last part of verse 3. A time to break down and a time to build up. A coming saying in our, in our culture, and our society that we live in today, we've all heard it. It says if it ain't fixed or if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Basically saying that if it's still halfway functional, if it's still halfway working, then we just need to leave it alone. Don't, don't do anything to it. Uh, Many people live their lives the same way. Their motto is, my life is functioning just fine, so I don't really need anything fixed. I don't have any problems, and I really don't need any outside help. And what what they're really doing is not being truthful with themselves, Brother Billy, because everybody has problems. Everybody has needs that they they have to be met. Sometimes there's problems that we need fixed in our lives, Sister Connie, so they're really not being honest when they say that. But what they don't realize... And we look at it like this, Brother Shannon, what they really don't realize is that if we don't tell God that it's broken, it's not going to get fixed. We've, we've got to tell God, hey, we've got to have some help. He'll, he'll be there. He knows our needs. He knows what we have need of. But there comes a point and a time in our life where we've got to tell him. In other words, until you admit you've got a problem, God will not help you with that problem. Now, my focus is going to be on sin for a little while, so y'all just, y'all just bear with me. There's three avenues of sin, if you want to talk about, in the Bible. There's the lust of the flesh, there's the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These are avenues, if you will, that sin will enter into our body. It will enter into a human being, if you will. It's an avenue that the devil will use against us. That lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, it's, it's how he gets a hold of us. So, uh, an illustration that I, I want to use, and I thought it was a fantastic illustration that I found while reading over some of these lessons, and y'all just bear with me while I, I read this. I thought this was really, really interesting. It said, a Harvard biologist, Edward Wilson, performed a rather bizarre experiment on ants. After noticing that it took ants a few days to recognize one of their crumpled nestmates as having died, he determined that ants identify death by clues of smell. Not visually, but by smell. As the ant's body began to decompose, other ants would invariably carry it out of the nest to a refuse pile that they had out there. They would carry the dead ants out to this pile and leave them. After many tries, Wilson narrowed down the precise chemical clue to what is called oleic acid. It's called oleic acid, and if ants smelled oleic acid, they would carry out the corpse of these other ants, or any other smell, or any other smell, they would ignore it. So if they would smell this oleic acid, they would pick this other ant up that had died and carry it out to this refuge pile, and they would leave it. Their instinct was so strong that if he dabbed oleic acid on a bit of paper, other ants would carry that paper out to the ant cemetery. In a final twist... Wilson painted oleic acid on the bodies of living ants. Sure enough, their nestmates seized them and marched them out, their legs and antenna wiggling in pro- pro- protest out to the ant cemetery. They based it on the smell of this oleic acid, which smelt like death to them. 
And it didn't matter that they were alive, Brother Jill. It didn't matter that they could see that they were moving, that they were wiggling, that they were struggling. They were bound to determine them, carry them out to what is called the ant cemetery. <laughs> Thus they deposited the ants or the living dead, if you will, unless they cleaned themselves off before returning to the nest. If they did not remove every trace of this oleic acid, their nest mates would promptly seize them again and return them to the ant cemetery. They had to be certifiably alive, judged solely by smell, being, being, before being accepted back into the nest. Sin for us is like oleic acid. It's the sin of death upon us. We are coated in it, and there's nothing we can do to get it off of us. Our best efforts is to wash yourself, which doesn't get rid of the stench itself, even in our best efforts. Our efforts to cover the stench with good works doesn't help either. It's still on us, and it's just a matter of time before we get carried away and dumped in the sin cemetery, which is hell. And I thought that was a, a very good illustration. That's how it is for us. We ourselves can do nothing to remove ourselves from the stench of death or the stench of sin. There's nothing, Brother Jill, that we can do on our own to remove that smell. But Jesus covered us with something that is capable of removing the stench of death and restoring us to God. It's His blood. When we are washed in His blood, when we are baptized in Jesus' name, Brother Johnny, that takes away the sin. That's what gets rid of it. In the old shepherding communities, Brother Billy, all would have understood this image because all knew the problem of the shepherd. He would check his flock in the morning and find a new lamb, but the mother had died during the night. In another portion of the flock, he would find a mother sitting silently beside a lamb stillborn during the night. The mother would die of a broken heart, and the orphan lamb would die from lack of substance. All logic would tell us that you put this orphan lamb with this mother where her baby died. But you see, that wouldn't work because she would not accept it because of the smell. She would not accept it, but the two would not accept each other. That's like us. We are so separated from God that God is dying of a broken heart and we are dying from lack of substance. We are foreigners one to another. It seems hopeless. But one thing can be done. It's still being done by shepherds today. If you slit the throat and drain the blood of the dead baby and you wash the orphan in the blood of the lamb, the living mama smells her own blood, if you will, and will move around so that baby can suck. You take the lamb and you wash it in the blood of the lamb that died and the mother will accept it. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. It what makes us together with him. We could do nothing to remove ourselves from the sin of sin and the sin of death, but Jesus did it for us when he died on Calvary. He removed the stench from us by shedding his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin. There's no washing sin away from us without the shedding of blood that he did when he died on Calvary. Right. Right. And I thought these were just awesome illustrations to, to show us what sin was like, but what the blood of God will do for us. The blood of Jesus Christ will wash that sin away. Yeah. Now, Romans 5 and 12, Brother Shannon, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed Upon all men, for all have sinned, for that all have sinned. Now, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God gave them a specific instruction. Basically, he told Adam, he said, of every tree in this garden, you can eat of but one. We all know the story. It's nothing new that I'm going to share with you tonight. But I had a little bit of a different perspective to it, if you will. He told them, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not going to eat of this tree. Don't eat of it. He told Adam that. He went and told Eve that. The Lord said, don't eat of this tree. I begin, to, I begin to really think about the enticement of sin and how strong the enticement of sin is to individuals or to people at different times. Adam and Eve had been placed in this Garden of Eden, which means paradise. There was a, 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 a mist that came up from the ground, and it kept it watered, Brother Johnny. It, it, it was a beautiful place. Sister Nadine, it probably had the perfect temperature at all times. There were probably no insects there, Brother Jesse, to have to deal with. 
It was just a beautiful place, and God placed them right in the middle of the Garden of Eden. He said, you've got dominion over every animal that's there. Everything. You've got dominion over it. Just, just a beautiful place to be at. Can you imagine? I begin to let my imagination run wild, if you will. Uh, in my imagination, I think it would have been a wonderful place to explore, Sister Kim, to, just to be able to go through the garden and see all the things that God had created, all the exotic animals, all the, the lions and the tigers and the, the peacocks. Maybe even there were dinosaurs there. I had no idea. But think about that. Think of what a, what a beautiful place it would have been to explore. God had created all this for them. Brother Pete, he put them there. Such a beautiful place to explore. And I begin to think about the enticement of sin. And I begin to get this picture. Here Eve was, could have been anywhere in the garden that she had wanted to be, could have been doing anything that she had wanted to do. But where do we find her hanging out at? We find her hanging out at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I, I thought about that, Brother Gio. I thought, that's, you know, here she has this, this paradise. And we find her standing at the tree that God told him not to eat. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, the enticement of sin. No doubt she was standing there, just her mouth watering, if you will, the taste of that fruit of that tree, and she was just looking for an excuse to bite that fruit. That's the way it is with sin with us sometimes. It's an enticement to us. It looks good. And I'll get into it a little bit later. It looks good. But there she is. She's standing at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil out of, out of this whole garden. And there we find Eve. And we know that the serpent came up to her and he began to cause her to question God. I've got Genesis 3, 1 through 7 loaded in there. He's going to be putting it up there in the King James Version. But I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only, from, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you're going to die. You won't die, the, the serpent replied to the woman. You're, you're not going to die. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced because the serpent told her this. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. She took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open, and they were suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, because of where she was at, my mama always told me when I was a young man growing up, she said, son, don't never go any place where you regret being there. Don't never go any place where you're going to be able to get in trouble and you're going to regret being there. And I tried to to heed her instructions. Uh, I really didn't have much of a childhood, and I'm not meaning that bad. I just didn't have time to be a child because... I went to work at a young age and tried to help my mom and make a living because my dad left when I was 12. But I always tried to listen to what mom told me, and that makes a lot of sense as I've got older. Son, don't ever put yourself in a place where you're going to be sorry that something could happen. And here we find Eve in this place. She's, she's right there looking at this, this tree. She allowed the, the serpent to deceive her in the, her way of thinking or, or what God had told her, causing her to question whether God's instructions to Adam was right. She didn't hear the words for herself. All she had was what Adam had told her. And Adam had said, don't eat of this tree because God said don't eat of this tree. And and I've always said this, ladies. We like to get down on the ladies because Eve was the one that ate the fruit, Sister Shannon. But I've always said this, that she ate of the fruit, but she was tempted. She was questioned. But Jill, I believe that when she went to Adam and she gave him that fruit, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what tree that fruit had come off of. He's just looking for an excuse to eat of it too. I believe that he knew where that fruit came from. And he did not hesitate. He ate it too, the Bible tells us. And because of sin, human beings are fundamentally broken. It's it's just a fact. Sin has a way of seducing us because it 
promises satisfaction and fulfillment. Outwardly, it looks good. It looks enticing. But outward looks can be very deceiving because sin is a trap. Sin is a trap. Sin does not, does not and will not satisf- satisfy us. Oh, it'll bring pleasure for just a little while. It, it'll feel good for just a little while. You know, that high lasts for just a little while. The drink lasts for just a little while. But it's not satisfying. It feels good, and that's why it's so powerful and, and addictive to us. But there's no lasting satisfaction in sin. We're left with an empty and an unclean feeling, ungratified and a hollow feeling. Moses said that he would rather suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So we know that there is pleasure in it. We know that there is a good time to be had, but it only lasts for a little while. It's temporary. Sin will enslave us. Proverbs 5 and 22 says, The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnares him, and the cords of sin hold him fast. It will latch on to you, it will grab on to you, and it will, it will destroy you if you allow it to. When a person sins, they are tying themselves up. You know, a lot of people look at us and our religion that we can't do anything. Have you ever heard that? Well, you Pentecost people, you can't do anything. I got news for them. I'm the one that's free. I can do what I want. I'm not bound by sin, Brother Gio. I'm not bound by anything. They're the ones that are tied up. They're the ones that are being destroyed because they're tied to sin. But sin will not allow them to see that every time a person sins, it becomes harder and harder for them to resist and easier for them to yield to the temptation. The more and more that we give in to it, the easier that it becomes. The finality of sin is that it will destroy a person. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. James 1, 14 through 15 tells us, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bring forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Sin in our lives will cause us to be broken, which will always result in us being separated from God. That's what sin does, Brother Jill. It separates us from God. Brother Jill. Of his own lust. And enticed. It wouldn't do a dime's worth of good for me to get down and ask the Lord to forgive me for snorting cocaine. No. Or for shooting up heroin. Or to forgive me for going and getting drunk. And I I just just realized that a lot of people try to get to this place selectively. They want to repent of of maybe something they did 30 years ago or whatever. But it's the lust, the sin that's our problem is the things our flesh wants to do. Right. You know, we mm-hmm. we can't we got to get the things out of our life that attract right. us, that appeal to us, right. that are causing our downfall. Mm-hmm. It is not, you know, I know drugs are bad. Right. But that ain't my problem. Nope. You know, getting high is not my problem. You know, so it doesn't do me any good to, to ask the Lord to deliver me from stuff that, that has no appeal to me whatsoever. Right. It's the wrong things mm-hmm. that I know they're there right. that are what's my enemy. Mm-hmm. And I've got to honestly say, and I've really felt strongly impressed in the prayer room to pray for honesty in the church tonight. Honesty with the Word of God. Honesty with what the Spirit wants to do. And let God be God in our lives. Right. And realize the problem's not all those things I could do. Mm-hmm. It's what I am doing. Right. It's what's in my life right now that that's causing me a problem that I want to do. Right. That I want to do it. You don't necessarily have to start hating hate the sin before you need to repent of it. Nope. You know, good chance you need to repent of it before you hate it. <laughs> right. And let the Lord give you that hate for it. Mm-hmm. And, and we all know what our weaknesses is. We know, we know where we're weak at when it comes to sin, when it comes to things that we should stay away from. We all know where our weakness is at. It's, it's nothing new to us. It's nothing new to us. We've all heard the old saying, sin will take you further than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay. 
because it's out to destroy you. Satan, the devil's ultimate goal is to totally destroy a person's life to the point that they cannot find their way back to God. His ultimate goal is to destroy a person's life where they cannot find their way back to God. That's, that's, what, that's what he's out for because he knows that when they do, there's a reconciliation that begins. There is a, a bringing back together, if you will, between you and God when you find a place of repentance, when you find that place to begin to cry out to God and to ask God to help you with what you've got going on in your life. And it's, it's at that time that a healing process begins in our lives, Sister Eloise. When we learn how to cry out to God and ask Him for help, that's when the healing process begins and God can put us back together. That's, that's, that's where it happens. The psalmist David discovered this principle during his own life through his own failures. In, in Psalms 34 and 18, it says, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as of a contrite spirit. That means you're, you're earnest with God. You, you know that there's something wrong there. Psalms 51 and 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. Lord, you're not going to look away. You're not going to hate those things that come up in me when I know that I'm broken. When I know that I'm broken and that I need your help, you're going to tune your ears to me and you're going to hear my cries. The Lord won't hate that. And David prayed this prayer. Psalms 51 is a prayer that he prayed after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and all these things that had happened. David began to pray this prayer in Psalms 51 when he realized that he needed to fall on his knees and get his heart right back with God, Brother Dole. Because of our way of thinking sometimes, we think of a broken heart or a broken spirit as a sad spirit or a weeping heart. Somebody's just... They're sad or they're weeping because something's going on in their life. But really, it's, it's more than that. The true meaning of David's Hebrew expression used in this verse really does mean broken. And when you look at that definition of what broken is, broken is violently separated into pieces or parts. It's being shattered. It's being damaged. It's being fractured, disrupted. It's being made weak, subdued. It's being crushed. It's being bankrupt, disconnected, not complete or full. So when you're broken, you're shattered into pieces, if you will. Have you ever felt like that in your life? I felt broken, Brother Jesse, in my life at times. But there's a realization that's got to take place, and I'm so thankful that it, that it did. David realized two very powerful truths as he prayed this prayer. First, that his heart was broken. There was definitely something wrong with it, Brother Mark. Not, not that he was just sad, but there was something really, really wrong with his heart. He had that realization. The second thing that God is attracted to brokenness. That's very important that God is attracted to brokenness. When he sees your cries and he sees the, the, the way that your life is, and you're earnest, Brother Billy, in the way we pray. He's attracted to us. There's something that makes him want to step on the scene and begin to put us back together again. That's awesome when you think about that. When God can look down and see that, that's awesome. David knew that if it ain't broken, God would not fix it. That is that why David did not mind admitting that he had a real problem in his life. When David made a mistake, what did he do? He found an altar of repentance. Every time. He always found a place to pray. He said, I am forgotten as a dead man out of my mind, and I am like a broken vessel. The whole purpose of the Old Testament was to show man that he was broken and he needed God's help. That's why the law was given. That's why the law was needful at that time. Romans 7 and 7, and uh, this is the NIV verse. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. The law taught them in that day what sin was all about. That's why God gave Moses the law. There was the uh, ceremonial law, and there was the moral law, and there was civil law. There were three, three brackets of law that, that, that was given to them. And I can tell you that the Ten Commandments is still in effect today. 
They still apply to us today. He said, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. And he just uses that for an illustration, if you will. But the law said you shall not covet your neighbor or your neighbor's wife or whatever your neighbor has. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that because the law told him that. He knew that it was wrong. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Galatians 3 and 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. It taught them that if they broke the law, they had to offer a sacrifice to God to get back right with him. Now, I'm thankful that we're still not living under the law today. And we still do not have to offer the sacrifices that they had to offer. God became the ultimate sacrifice for us when he died on the cross. Uh, the law of Moses contained many illustrations concerning brokenness. Any earthen vessel contaminated by an unclean object, either by an animal or a person, was to be broken. When leprosy had broken through the skin, a person was unclean and had to be separated from everyone else. When leprosy had broken out within the walls of a house, the house was to be broken down or destroyed, if you will. No sacrifice that was imperfect was allowed to be offered to God. The sacrifices that were offered had to be perfect. They had to be without any blemish or anything wrong with them, Brother Johnny. And no man who was broken or blemished was permitted to enter in the presence of God as a priest, showing that our brokenness separates us from God. The lame man couldn't go into the temple because he was lame. He wasn't complete. He wasn't whole. It wasn't that he couldn't be carried in there. He just not could, he couldn't go into the temple because of his condition. Leviticus 21, 17 through 19 and 21 lays this out for us. Now, the whole focal point of my lesson in these illustrations is that humanity, and I'm talking about you and I, I'm talking about mankind, has and continues to be broken by sin. And until sin's power is broken in our lives, we live under the threat of eternal destruction. Either we're going to break sin in our lives or sin will destroy us. Either we break sin in our life or sin will destroy us. People become broken by many things. Sometimes by other people. Sometimes it's by circumstances that breaks us. Sometimes even God can break us. But the majority of the time we have the tendency to break ourselves by the decisions and the mistakes that we make. Our stubborn insistence on doing the things our way is our own worst enemy a lot of times. The good news is that no matter how broken that we are, no matter how destroyed that sin has made a person, God is willing to fix them up. God is willing to help them if they will cry out and ask for help. I, I don't have a whole room full of sinners, I know that, but this is a very, I, very, I thought this was a very good lesson. It's, it's something for all of us to know and realize because we're all still in the flesh. We all still struggle with things in our life, right? It's just, it's just the way it is. It's the way that we're created, Brother Johnny. It's our nature. Psalms 147 and 3 says, He healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. Luke 4 and 18, Brother G.L. uses quite often, says the Spirit of the Lord, and this is Jesus preaching. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's why he came for. That was from an Old Testament passage. I believe it was Isaiah 60 or 61 that this, this came from, that he was preaching that message out of. The only thing that you and I need to break sometimes is our pride and admit that we need God's help. That's, that's a pretty powerful word when you talk about pride. When you have to talk about asking for help, we've got to get pride out of the way, Sister Maria. We've got to get it out of the way and know that God can step in and break the power of sin. Brother Woodward said pride is not really, when you, when you think about pride, and, and I kind of stopped and thought about this when I read that, but pride is not really that we think too much of ourselves. You know, like a, a lot of times, Brother Roger, we want to think that pride is that we puff ourselves up. You know, that I'm all this in a bag of chips. You ever heard of that, girls? Pride's not really like that, he said. We, not that we think too much of ourselves, but the fact that we think too much about ourselves. 
that we think too much about ourselves, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Pride makes me the sinner instead of God. And I thought that was such an awesome point that it makes me the sinner when I think about myself all the time instead of God being the sinner. Very, very important. Brother Woodward said, and here you go again, I really like what he says. He says, you don't come to an altar to add God to your life. Let me just let that sink in for just a minute. You don't come to an altar to add God to your life. You come to an altar to break down the altars, the sin that, you, that has you broken. And then you build an altar to God. You don't come to an altar to add God to your life. You come to an altar to break down the altars to sin that have you broken, and then you build an altar to God. He said every human being has an altar to something or someone in their lives, but they need to replace that with an altar to God. We need to get those things out of our life that we've got altars built to and replace it with an altar to God. I thought that was such such awesome, an awesome thought. He says when we, when we apply that principle to our lives, when we come to the realization that I'm broken by sin, sin has me destroyed, but it's through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that Brother Gio has preached and preached and preached at us, the gospel message, the truth, the death, burial, resurrection, that I can begin to build something good with my life. No longer am I a slave to sin, but through the power of the Holy Ghost, I become a new creature in Christ. When I realize that in my life, I've talked about being broken by sin, and now I want to look at building for life. Building our lives over again, if you will, which always begins when a person makes that conscious decision that they're ready for a change. And that always begins at repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the filling of the Holy Ghost. That's when change starts in a person's life. Can I get an amen? That's, that, that is it. That's the gospel. For, we, for us to begin to build up our lives, we will always need God working effectively in our lives. We will never be able to accomplish it on our own. I cannot do it on my own. When I begin to think about a person making a change in their life, we have to realize uh, that it always begins with us. It's my choice. It's my decision. Brother G.L. can preach his heart out as he's done so many times. I, I can teach and tell you what you need to do, but until you make that decision yourself, until you make that choice yourself, there's nothing ever going to happen. I begin to go back to, to Brother Gio mentioned the other night, and this is part of a lesson that I had taught before, and I began to think, Brother Johnny, about being broken and being able to be put back together, and I thought about uh, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. Brother Gio said we need to go read it, and read it often because it's such powerful words that God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. He said, the word which came to Jeremiah saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel he, was, he made was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Said the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in mine, O house of Israel. There's times in our life that we've got to go back and put ourselves on the potter's wheel. Very, very important that we, that we know that. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. God's message was twofold. He said, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and it's there I will cause thee to hear my voice. Jeremiah, you've got to get up, and you've got to go to the potter's house, because that's where you're going to hear the word of the Lord. That's where I'm going to speak to you at. Get up, Jeremiah. Take yourself to the potter's house, because that's the place I'm going to speak my message to you. That's the place that I'm going to talk to you. That's the place that you're going to find out what you need to do. God's reaching for those that have no one else to turn to. Those that life itself has shattered and tossed them away. 
They've reached a place of desperation in their lives, and they're looking for something better. He doesn't care what our background is. He doesn't care what our skin color is. He doesn't care how much money that we make. He doesn't care what kind of clothes we have. He doesn't care that society has turned their back on us. He doesn't care. He said, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. It doesn't matter to him who it is, Brother Eugene. He says, come. Even if he's got to reach down and pluck you out of the mouth of hell, he wants you to come to him. I want to share a portion of thought I had on this scripture. There's going to be times in our walk with God that before we can get to the potter's house, that we have to experience a journey through the valley of Hinnom. And that's the place that he had to go. That's the place that Jeremiah had to go through to get to the potter's house. Because sometimes we're going to have to go down before we can go up. Sometimes we're going to have to go through a valley, Brother Johnny. Sometimes there's going to be those low times and those dark times before we can get up to the mountaintops. But we learn more in our valley experiences than we do on our mountaintop. There's a lot of times, Sister Jessica, that when I'm in the valley, that's when God can talk to me. That's when God can help me. Because when I'm on the mountaintop, I've got victory. Down here, I'm going through some things. A bunch. Because they just give up. They give up. Because their commitment's not that strong. Uh, that when you go through a trial, that you give up before you make it all the mm-hmm. way to the end. That God never has an opportunity to bless you like he wants to. Right. Because you put it this through through a tough time. Mm-hmm. How many, how many folks do you reckon? Man, well, gee, I say a bunch. A bunch, a whole lot. Because they, their commitment just wasn't there. <laughs> their commitment wasn't there, and it takes an effort on our part to push through it, Brother Billy. Brother David, I know a lot of times I've went through valleys of stuff in my lifetime, and you know they always say that you come out victorious. Well, that's just a wonderful feeling when you know you've been tried by the fire, and when you overcome something, there's no feeling like that to know when you're getting a blessing of the Lord or right. whatever it is out of that. That's right. You know, the Bible talks about uh, frustrating the grace of God. God. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that may be what it is, that God is rooting you on, Mm -hmm. you know, to make it through this struggle so he can give you what he wants to give you. Right. You know, I mean, it's kind of like Peter. Mm -hmm. And Peter, even though he denied the Lord, He's still back with the disciples before he ever knows the Lord's forgiven him. Right. He stayed with the group, Mm -hmm. even though in his heart. And when Jesus showed up, he told all the disciples, he said, y'all come go with me. And he said, and you too, Peter. Peter. Think about what the Lord is waiting. That's why we've got to have a commitment, Brother David, a commitment. That's that's exactly right. That's bigger Mm -hmm. than anywhere we've ever been. And bigger than what we're going through right now. Right. Because the Bible is promise after promise after promise after promise. Of, and I'm just sitting here thinking, even up here you look out over the, <laughs> over the congregation and see folks that I know struggling. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, be honest. Right. My God. We've all been there, man. The question has to be asked, are they going to make it? Right. Are they going to make it through what the devil's brought against them, mm-hmm. or or what they've brought against themselves? Are they going to make it to the place of completion? Are they going to come through flawed as it may be? Sometimes, brother Billy, we come through victorious, but with some scars. You know, sometimes right. we we get built up, but that scar never leaves because it's a reminder right. of. What God brought us That's right. to bring us here. You're right. As Brother Billy said, he says, Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we, faint if we faint not. In the book of Galatians, it tells us that. So it's going to take 
persistence, as you was talking about earlier. It's going to take persistence on our part. It's going to take a made-up mind to push through that, to, to get through that valley experience that we all go through in our walk with God, that we all go through in life, period. But we need to realize that we've got God on our side. And he's for us. Even though we're in that valley, he's still with us. Somebody going to say something to us? Right, and that's we shouldn't, but, but we're human beings, and it, it does take take that. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. When we look at going through the valley, I, I think about what David said in Psalms 23. Uh, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going through a valley, but I'm going to the house of the Lord. That's where you got to go. I'm, I'm going there, Sister Eloise, but I'm going, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a decision that we've got to make. It's in the valley that we learn the nature of God. It's, it's his presence in our pain. It's his love in our loss. His patience despite our complaints. It's through hardship he may have to strip us of our pride and renew our passion for him. He's going to purify us and he's going to refine our character in the valley. Now when we get to the potter's house, Brother Doyle, we're going to find two wheels that are being turned by the potter's foot and a piece of clay being held in the hands of the potter. There's really nothing high-tech at the potter's house when you look at the potter's wheel, but it's a high touch that it has placed on it. There's nothing high-tech, but there's a high touch that's being placed on that piece of clay. The first step that we've got to take is simply putting ourselves on the potter's wheel, into the hands of the master potter, which is God Almighty. That's, that's us making the decision and say, Lord, here I am, I give up, you do the work, and you mold me, you make me, and you shape me into what you want me to be. Mm -hmm. us. Well, where is there to go? There's only two places if you, if you walk with God, you don't want to go to hell. Nope. You're in it to win. Right. And so we've got to fight. And you have to do exactly that. That's exactly right. Talk and speak with God and he will. That's right. When we make the decision to put ourselves on the potter's wheel, something happens right there. Because it's at that point that we give God the right to our lives. Brother Pete, it's at that point when I say, God, I can't do it. 
You're going to have to do it for me. We cannot mold ourselves because if we do, he's going to step back and say, oh, you think you can do it better than I can? He's not going to do it if you're going to try to still be in control. We're no match for the potter. He knows the end from the beginning. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he's everywhere. If we try to be in control, he will never apply his hands to our life if we're trying to be in control. He will not mold an unwilling vessel. I think the hardest part about this process is that we're not willing to leave ourselves on the potter's wheel long enough. We're not willing to say, Lord, I, w- I want to be a finished product. He gets us about halfway there and we think, well, we're all right. And we get up and go on our own. And that's when that vessel becomes marred in the hands of the potter again. We don't stay on the, a potter's wheel long enough for him to mold us and shape us as he sees us. Stop and think about that for a minute. How many of you see yourself one way But in actuality, God sees you in another way. We don't, Brother Jill, we don't allow him enough time to mold us and shape us and make us into the image that he sees us as being. He sees us as being a finished product, and he says, this is what you're going to be, but we get in the way a lot of times ourselves. We're going to be that vessel that bears his name and is going to be used for his glory if we will just have patience and allow him to do the work in us. God told Jeremiah, and Brother Jill, you refer to this quite often. He said, before I formed thee in the belly of your mother, I knew you. I knew you. I sanctified thee. I adorned thee a prophet of the nations. Jeremiah told the Lord, I cannot speak because I'm a child. The Lord tells him, he says, you're not a child. And that he's going to go and he's going to say what the Lord would tell him. Do not be afraid. For I am with thee. The Bible says the Lord touched his mouth and said, I have put words in thy mouth. This day have I set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. Now, we've talked about Jeremiah a lot of times. Jeremiah preached the word of God for 40 years through the reigns of five kings. And not one person gave their heart in life to God during that whole time. Try to kill him. They, they took him, put him in a cistern, left him for dead. You know, uh, it's just unbelievable what they did to this poor man. But what he say, Brother Jill? He said he wasn't going to speak, but he said the words of God was like fire shut up in his bones. It was something that he couldn't contain it, that he had to speak what God told him to speak because God touched his lips and told him that he was going to do that. I believe God has a plan and a purpose for everyone here tonight. I believe that with all my heart. The secret to the potter's mastery is this touch. And as I said, one of the most sophisticated tools he uses is his hands. We cannot perceive or understand God's hands in our life. We will never see what he wants us to be. If we do not allow God to change our spirit in our nature, then it will never change our destiny. It will never change where God wants us to go. If a master potter would give a novice the will to form the clay, it said that nine out of the ten times uh, it would collapse. A master potter says the first move a novice will make is to start at the top and press down on the clay. But we have to go down to get to the potter's house, but when we get up to the potter's wheel, there's only one way that a master potter will shape a piece of molding or a piece of clay. And he starts at the bottom and he lifts it up. He starts at the bottom and he lifts it up. God will always lift us up even when he's working the lumps out in our lives. That's why we have to be patient with him. He wants to take out the things that are hindering us, those impurities that we have in our life, our past, our attitudes, our angers, our our, our disappointments, our inability to forgive others, our insecurities. He wants to take all these things out of us so he, he can make us into the vessel that he wants to make us. 
Brother Brian Kinsey that preached this message said the mystery of the potter's will is this. How can the clay be marred in the hands of an almighty God, the creator of the universe, the original potter that formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? You see, the mystery is in the clay. There's still imperfections in it. But God has the power to change the clay. If we are in the perfect will of God, there's still going to be things that go wrong. Or if we're out of the will of God, things are going to go wrong. But if we learn to stay on the potter's will and not get off too quickly, God will take out those imperfections in our life and even create us into another vessel that he wants to form. The word broken, as I've already said, means broken. It means violently separated into parts, shattered, damaged, fractured, not complete or full. And there's a, there's a song that says, it's called Bring Christ Your Broken Life. And it says, Bring Christ Your Broken Life, so marred by, skin, by sin, He will create anew and make you whole again. Your empty, wasted years He will restore and your iniquities remember no more, bring Christ your broken life. The greatest demonstration of God's power throughout the Scripture is how God salvages a broken and helpless lives. And there's a couple, a couple men that came to my mind. Uh, there was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Manasseh, and he was Hezekiah's son. And he was appointed to be king, but basically he... He went like a wild man. He went like a a crazy man. They carried him off into captivity. He was destined to be the king. And they carried him off into captivity. And he just, he he was just out of his mind. But something happened. Something began to take place in his life. And he began to think about what God had done for his father. He added 15 years on Hezekiah's life. And he began to talk to God. And he began to repent. He, He basically was just like a wild man living in a cage. They had him put out for all the people to see. They had him locked up, his enemy did. But God began to work on him, and God began to renew his life. And God restored him as the king. Such a testimony of what God can, God can do to an individual. I think about the, the, the man at Gadadra that, that lived among the tombs. The Bible said that he was often bound in chatters and fetters and chains, and that he would break them, that he would cut himself that he would live among the, 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 the tombs there. He lived in a cemetery, run crazy like a wild man. And we know Jesus came on shore, cast the devils out of this man, said that when the town got to him, they found him clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's what I'm talking about, the power to restore a broken life, the power to put it back together again. The keys to allowing, the keys to allowing God to rebuild our lives, and I'm getting ready to close, is to acknowledge that I'm broken. It requires co- complete surrender on our part. It's for us to submit ourselves to the will of God. It's for us to have faith in God, and it's for us to allow God to do the work and direct the rebuilding of our lives. We've got to trust the process of the potter because he's molding us into a vessel of honor to bear his name. First Peter 2 and 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous life. Now there's going to be times that we're going to have to go through the fire to become like the Lord. Because the clay has to be put through the fire, and sometimes even the fire causes cracks in the vessel. So the potter would go out, and he would find this insect called a fasuka insect, Brother Billy, which was like a tick. And he takes the blood from it, and he mixes it with the powder pottery, and he applies it to the crack. And he will put the vessel back into the fire to burn it again, and there's a transformation that takes place. Because after the vessel comes out of the fire, you cannot find the crack anywhere in it. The blood of Jesus Christ still flows today and is still washing away sin that has stained us and marred us. 1 John 1 and 7 says, But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ 
His son cleanses us from all. We stand with me. I'm gonna, I've got one last part I want to read. I want to leave you with four facts about the master, God Almighty. The potter knows the origin of the clay. The potter knows the nature of the clay. And the potter knows what's best for the clay. And the potter knows how to properly handle the clay. So whoever become broken, we know where we have to turn to. We know where we have to go to. We have to go back to God and allow him to rebuild our lives. Can you just raise your hands and thank the Lord for that right now, Lord?